Good evening. We're just going to give people a few more minutes to come in, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some things I've done before. Um, if you haven't been here, um, this is your first time. Uh, we're excited. This study's been uh, rewarding for a lot of folks. I've got a lot of great feedback. It was a uh, originally a kind of a trial basis on a discussion. Hi, Ronnie. Um, and I have a Zoom meeting site. If you go to the site, it's very easy to jump in, and you can you can participate in the discussion that hopefully will happen. If not, if you're on Facebook Live, uh, you, you can write out um, kind of being uh, uh, just an observer. So we've been talking about a lot of topics. Um, we have two more weeks left. Um, this is a week, this is like a bio week that hopefully I'll use uh, Louis Zamperini as a catalyst to help you if you're in a severe situation. Um, such as PTSD or something to that effect. And so hopefully as you look at uh, Louie's life and you'll see there are answers and there are uh, um, solutions. Uh, and if you need help, you, you need to get help. Um, so you're not without hope. And we're gonna talk about that. But anyway, getting back to what I was talking about, um, I distracted my own self. So we've been going through this, this um, you know, six weeks to the day, and we covered a lot of topics. And, and you know, I appreciate feedback if you can give me some. Um, I find it. I found. I find it's been uh, a uh, um, a time of uh, of challenge when I'm talking to myself at times. But I, I I love the feedback that I get for people who watch the these uh, sessions live, or for those who watch them later, as I put them back up in a video form or if you watch the live as it hangs out on my page um, I'm, i am storing every one of these videos on the overcoming obstacles page and you can you can go there anytime and start from the beginning you can uh, chinese menu it and pick a topic that you find is uh, applicable to you um, and, and go there and watch the video and and write to me call me uh, whatever is best for you and we can uh, we can discuss it on, on the side or offline um, you know one thing good about um, you know uh, what I hope to do with my life is to do it in groups or do it one-on-one -on -one or or doing it this way however however God has arranged it I want to be doing it so if it's just me and you in a uh, in a Dunkin Donuts or, or somewhere else or over a telephone call I was on the phone today on the way home from work on a, on a cell call, helping somebody make good decisions on whether they should have purchased windows or not. And I, you're saying to me, how can that be helpful or, or how can that be rewarding? But it's encouraging to, to help people and to, to put people at ease that, that God's still on the throne and he's going to take care of them. So, um, you yeah, know, so something as simple as somebody being a little bit traumatized by a sticker shock uh, home repair. Um, and you're ministering or you're trying to just be an encouragement to people. And that's that's what I've been trying to do through six weeks so far. And like I said, we have two more weeks to go. And uh, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll do something more on the other side of this. Um, I don't know if I'll do it every week, but I, I do want to continue to come up with, you know, topics um, that will be um, rewarding to more so to you than to me. And uh so that's what we've been doing. So, all right, we're going to get going here. So this week, uh, as I said, it's overcoming obstacles, and it's the unbroken, the Louis Samperini story. Uh, unbroken, by the way, if you don't know, was a um, was a uh, film. Uh, they've made two films from his life now. The first was uh, Angel Angelie D Jolene directed. It was her debut, and it did very well. Uh, people people loved it. Um, it's a it's a great story. We're going to touch on a lot of that today, as well as the second film, uh, which I still haven't seen, sadly. But we're going to be talking about Louis's life as he came back, mostly in this in this discussion. So mostly, it's going to be about Louis when he came home um, from the uh, from World War Two, and uh, and and hopefully you'll find it rewarding. So let's. Let's let's go off and talk about do some statistics. Let's talk about uh, post traumatic stress disorder. Um, it's it, it's it's what happens for people who face a significant trauma. Um, it it could be a car accident. It could be a wartime situation. Um, it could be any kind of time of intensity. Um, 
PTSD used to be just generally a thing that was applied to people who who were in a military uniform, but now it's being applied to people in any uniform or in any uh, very difficult situation where you can't um, adjust uh, emotionally to the situation. It's so terrible that you can't react to it. So, um, and it's a name that that's given to a person who struggles greatly after after the very difficult situation. Um, and when Louis, when we're going to talk about him, when 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 he was given. Uh, you know, this when he ended up in that situation, he, they didn't even have this term. So consider that as we talk about it. They didn't use that term. They didn't consider this even being a possibility. The only word they used back then was shell shock because people who got shelled and shelled and shelled had a hard time recovering. So it's been described in as, an, as, a, as a normal reaction in an abnormal situation. And that's in quotes. I, and that sounds strange to me when I read that. A normal reaction to an abnormal situation because the reality is, you know, not all of us react well in abnormal situations. Um, some of us are, are equipped somehow um, to be responsive in abnormal situations. And, and I, as I use that word, abnormal situation, I hopefully it brings something to your mind that, that you have found very challenging. And I can, I think. The, some of the principles we're going to talk about, even though you may not have PTSD, um, that you're still carrying something inside of you from that abnormal situation that you just can't get a handle on and, and you feel or maybe even alone with it. So hopefully we'll, you'll be able to apply some of these principles because that's the goal here tonight. The goal isn't that I believe that, that you know, 80 percent or 60 percent or even 30 percent of my friends or my family or people who are taking this in for the first time have PTSD. But do you do you struggle with it? Do you struggle? Do you actually struggle with PTSD or do you know somebody who does? And that's that's the, that's the question to, to start off. I mean, and if you do, well, the question you, you start asking yourself um, and I know people that have this. Um, Will I ever be normal again? And um, believe it or not, I, I, I've had young people I know who I've watched go off um, in various situations, both active duty and uh, National Guard, who ended up with PTSD. Um, and and for me, as a as a military guy, um, I I have a lot of extra empathy, maybe that maybe other people don't have. On the other hand, because of the way I served in my my type of military, I'm I'm very almost insulated from it because my type of sort. In fact, I'm wearing a I'm wearing a submarine shirt tonight. My type of warfare is very insulated. Um, we don't see our enemy. We you know theoretically. So other people that that get into these very intense situations see things uh, like combat veterans. Um, and then I'm going to bring up something else that there are a raft of 9/11 PTSD victims, and, you're, and these these people were in in again normal people in abnormal situations that you know to watch to watch or to try to rescue or to lose you know 90% of the people that you you worked with or 90% of the people you maybe fought fires with or maybe 90% you know i mean it, it it doesn't it doesn't um check well in the emotions so so there are a lot of people who in this era are are fighting PTSD maybe more than than we were aware of i i don't think we have percentages um for the great war uh world war 2 okay we didn't even use this term in vietnam we didn't say PTSD, so I, so it's a, it's it's really hard to measure how many of your parents had PTSD, and we didn't know, you know what I mean? You know they because they, they wouldn't talk about it or they wouldn't go see a, somebody to talk, get help. So anyway, some quick statistics: seventy percent of the adults in the U.S. have experienced some kind of traumatic event at least once in their lives. I'm going to give you a big number. That's two. 123.4 million people. 
Now, I have experienced traumatic events. So maybe have you, right? Now, this is the stat that I, I'm concentrating on when I talk about PTSD. 20% of those people, those 22, 223.4 million develop PTSD. As of today, that's 31.3 million people who, who, who have either had it or are struggling with it right now. That's 8% of your fellow citizens on this, on this continent. That's a lot of people. And, and they could have PTSD at any given time. They say one out of 10 women develops PTSD. You know, that's twice as many as men. I don't understand that, by the way. I'm a, I'm a father of uh, four children. I've seen four children born, and I believe the woman is the stronger of the sexes. Uh, they are they are amazing. They, I mean, uh, the fact that what they do with with their uh, with their with their craft of being, uh, you know, a mother, you know, and I don't let, I don't think men would do it. So I was shocked to hear that statistic. Among people who are victims are severe are of severe traumatic experience, or sixty to eighty percent will develop PTSD. So I, I want to offer these two truths right off the bat because I don't want it all negative. I, right away, you're not alone, and you're and there's hope. Right away. I don't care what the situation, if it's a military, is it rape, is it, is it child abuse, is it a violent assault, somebody broke into your house, um, um, and, and you're in this situation right now where you feel guilty, you feel trapped, you feel confused, you feel like you contributed to the situation somehow, um, and, there's, and, and there is a result of these things that you're suffering from depression, maybe addictions, you're abusing yourself, you have suicidal hope, there's hope. You know, there's recovery. There's, and if you remember these two truths, you're not alone, and there's hope, um, not just once, but over and over again. This is this is not, this is not about. I, I'm going to offer you tonight some instantaneous um, thing that that tonight you're going to be cured. I'm saying to you, if you were cured like like three years ago, and now you're sliding back, it's okay. We're going. It, you're still not alone, and there's still hope. And if you think about how bread is made. Uh, you know, it's needed and, and the yeast goes through the whole loaf and it takes time, right? And that's what I'm talking about tonight. And if you, if you consider these two thoughts or these two truths, they must be needed into you until they work through every part of you. And there's parts that we protect, even when we're getting counseling, we're going to hide that part. You know, we're not going to let that truth get to the deepest part of where we need to be ministered to. And it, t it takes time. And it's different for everybody else. I always say to people with, who are grieving that don't let people tell you how long you should grieve. Let, you know, you go through your normal grieving. Grieving is healthy, right? Same thing with this. It takes time. And people are get healthy on their time schedule sometimes. may not be yours. May, your loved one might be going through this and you're, you're impatient. But give it time. Give these people time. The damage you suffered has been done maybe more than one terrible moment. So that healing and, and, and restoration unfolds at a human pace, not not a computer pace. Not I, I got to excuse me. I'm going to look at my record books and I'm going to read up on what I think. No, it's not like that. It is this is a human pace? It unfolds at your pace, and it unfolds as part of your story, and it unfolds over time. You know, and I want you to just hold on and and begin to find. The right help and the right solution you need. And I'm going to offer you some at the at the end of this. So, all right. So, Louis Samperini, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to talk about him. So, Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. I ask you, Lord, that there are if, if there are folks here that are struggling with any one of the things I mentioned, depression, anxiety, they're they're struggling with um, some sort of uh, post traumatic stress situation. God, you would you would open their minds and their hearts, God, to to seek the right care to get the right friends around them to get the right family around them. people that are going to be uh, sensitive people are going to be gentle people are going to be in in there and caring for the long haul and i ask that this whole talk would be bathed god in your 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 love for for all of us god in your name we ask the same amen so so louis samperini his greatest obstacle um initially was his own own mortality um he uh, he goes into World War II. His entire focus is on surviving. He uh, he he's at odds um, against him. He he joined the Air Force in 1941. He's stationed in the Pacific as a bombardier, by the way. Um, 
in a B-24. I'm not, I'm not, a, it's funny, I work for the Air Force and I'm terrible with aircraft. I, I probably saw one of these and only remember it. So, flying into combat was only half the danger due to most of the technical problems, inadequate training. 50,000 airmen die in non-combat related accidents at this time. So, he's, he's trying to stay alive is just a challenge. So, it's not unusual that Louis' plane crashed into the ocean and he and his crewmates uh, were out flying on a search and rescue for another plane that crashed. So I read a book called We Thought We Heard the Angels Sing, and it was about another plane crash where they were in the Pacific Ocean. And a Christian prayed crazy things, and fish flew into the boat, and Eddie Rickenbacker, he's a famous uh, World War Two World War One pilot, was on that raft. It's a documented story. So, but Louis survives the crash. He's out there for 47 days on this raft, and if you've seen the film, it's an amazing, it's an amazing, uh, the scope and everything. She did a great job. So this is Laura, Laura Hillebrand, who wrote the biography on Broken. She said this, the odds of being rescued if you ended up on a life raft were terrible. Why, why, is, why is that? Because the ocean is, 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 is huge. And by the way, I'm an Atlantic guy. I'm an Atlantic Ocean guy. The Atlantic Ocean is small compared to the Pacific Ocean where he went down. You know, Pacific Ocean is 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 massive. So Louis, I mean, Laura Hillbrand goes on to say these rafts were poorly equipped. So Louis and his crewmates were surviving and see longer than any other human survivors had ever survived because they were drinking rainwater and eating fish they managed to get. See, they weren't ready, okay, to survive. But that was that was only the beginning. Of course, he gets caught. He gets rescued. Who does he get res rescued by? the Japanese, and they sent him to a, a, a brutal prison of war camp where he's beaten, starved, never worked. And here's the, here's the big issue. Louis is a, is a world-class athlete, one of the fastest distance runners in the world. He ran in the 1936 Olympics with, with people like Jesse Owens. And there was someone else there. His name was I'm going to mess his name. Mushiri, Mushirini, Mushirino Wanatubi. And his nickname is called The Bird, if you watch the film. And he was jealous, and he was sadistic. And he singled Louis out, and he he was just... And it's cruel is not, not, not a statement. These events, of course, are dramatized in the film. And, of course, dramatized, not dramatized. They're, you know, covered in, in her book. Amazingly, he survives two years in this camp, and he gets released when the war ends. At last, he goes home. He was free and no longer living under the threat of death every day. But what happens to somebody that's been through this? He faces a bigger obstacle. He lives in the trauma of the past. It's only two years, right? Come on. Two years. 47 days on a raft. Can't you get out? No. He lives in he lives in inescapable memories of brutal treatment, and he came home deeply haunted, deeply, deeply haunted. You know, and even though his physical needs are being met and he's eating and everything's great, and the brutality of the war was over, he he had to confront his feelings and what what happened to him. So every night he would wake up like with nightmares and screaming and, and just imagining that the, these cruel guards were that were trying to kill him and trying to break his spirit were right there. And his thoughts would return every, every night, every time, to these horrific experiences. And he would relive, oh, yes, I, thank you. Sorry, I am. I'm muted. Sorry. See, I, my, I was muted on Zoom. That's not good. So coping with all these traumas, he, he's now diagnosed with PTSD, even though they didn't use the term. And it was not an obstacle he was prepared for. He began abusing alcohol, and soon his marriage began to suffer. So he is, he is, in, really, he is in really bad shape. And ironically, Louis had this resilient spirit. Um, if you watch the film, you see it. If you watch him... You know, when he was young, he had this resilient spirit, um, and he and, and he and he he starts to review some of the ways that 
that he can, he's trying to figure out how can I overcome these himself, right? So tonight I want to review some of that, some of those ways that Louis overcame this PTSD and went on to live 70 more fruitful years and happy years, free from the terrors of the past. And you can insert any word into PTSD. It could be divorce, uh, loss of a loved one. It could be uh, moving away from home or love, moving away from home or uh, loved ones. It could be unemployment, it could be health issues. It could be some sort of mental health issue, maybe mental health issue of somebody you know, depression. So Louis, Louis goes through this thing um, and, and he's on the verge of divorce. And his wife, Cynthia, has convinced, convinced him to go, you know, to this Billy Graham crusade in Los Angeles. And, and Louis wrote that he was resistant at first. He said, I was resentful. He later said, I had always been poisoned against such tent meetings since I was a youngster. But he finally relented and the message clicked for him. It reminded him of a deal he had made with God while struggling to survive on that life raft and began to believe that God would help him survive again. And that night at that crusade, he said it was unbelievable. He told Billy Graham um, and the association later in an interview, I didn't have a nightmare and I hadn't had one since. So his, his, his strong and immediate faith gave him a new sense of purpose and helped him with the next critical step in the healing process, which is forgiveness. Now you're saying, how could these people deserve to be forgiven? Right? I mean, I would think that, I mean, forgiveness is, it's one thing to, you know, give my pain to God. It's another thing to forgive anybody. Right. It's hard. It's hard. I, uh, one of my heroes is Corey Ten Boom, And, uh, she had similar experiences cause she was in, um, Ravensbrook. And she's not Jewish. She was a, she was just a Dutch Christian who helped high Jews, and they got caught. And her whole her whole family was basically killed in these camps, except for her. And she got out on a technicality. And she's going she's going around doing all these talks, and she's like, uh, she's written a great book, you know, the Hiding Place. If you, there's a film for that, and everything's going great. And the reality was that. She wasn't as great as she thought she was because coming down the center aisle, she's shaking hands and after one of her talks, and come down that center aisle as one of her guards and she recognizes him. And in that instant, in that 16 feet as she closes, she, all the hatred, all the anger, everything comes back, her, her, everything. And she had to choose to forgive or to hold that, hold that thing that she didn't even know she was still carrying forgiveness is hard by the way she forgave him she clutched his hand and it, she was delivered it, it's hard especially when it involves any kind of heinous act and i i know you've been treated badly by people why because we're human and we often treat each other awful whether it's work or whether it's you know we're in a school by a teacher or somebody you respect maybe a parent and it's hard to forgive people, but in, in Louis's case, such a cruel treatment by this man, the bird, it was continually inflicted on Louis, continuously. Experts encourage people to forgive offenses. Now, these aren't Christian experts, by the way. These are psychological experts, even large ones, as forgiveness leads to better physical health, reduced anxiety, and can prevent depression. So I, that's a quote from, from a health magazine. So why, why on earth would they get that idea, right? Why would they, why would they think that's good? And prior to Louis's conversion, he was drinking to be self-medicated, right? That's is what his son, Luke Zamperini said. He would self-medicate himself, put himself out, right? The real problem was his hatred for his former prison guards, his son said. But the fact was that his newfound faith taught him that you have to forgive your enemies. So he decided to make an effort to forgive even the bird. And in, in the, the Bible is really clear. It says, forgive your enemies, do good to those who harm you. Now that, that is, is crazy. You know what I mean? I mean, 
do good to those who harm you. I, I don't always understand it, but I've seen people change as you do it. I've seen people, they're, they're, the way they look at you. Because what happens is weeks, months later, it's suddenly they're, something's wrong, and then they're back seeing you and talking to you and looking for guidance or help or assistance or just somebody to listen because you cared about him. And Louis somehow comes to a conclusion that he's got to make the effort. So, and he, and he had vowed never to go back to Japan. He vowed never to go back. And Louis visits a Tokyo prison in 1950 to find one of his guards who was serving a sentence for the very thing he did to Louis and all of his fellow um, soldiers and sailors. You know, and they were serving sentences for that. He wanted to forgive the bird in person, but um, the bird refused his, his request. So Louis had to write him a letter, and he described in the letter how much his fierce treatment affected him and offering his forgiveness he said this love replace the hate i have for you and i i want i want you to find that today if you're struggling i want you to find find someone you know as you go through the process to get to this point you know but it doesn't start here it starts back with getting the right kind of help and finding finding people that can work with you and work you through this so you can get to a point where you can actually say something like love replace the hate i have for you you know and this is this is somebody who was tortured for two years louis experience seemed to defy hope and survival appeared impossible during his ordeal on the raft and throughout his inhumane treatment as a prisoner of war and he lived with the knowledge, even if he could survive the prison camps, the Japanese guards had promised to kill all the prisoners if, if Japan surrendered. So even then, he, he, he always seemed like he was in a hopeless situation. Yet, even then, because he made this promise to God, he made a vow with God on that raft. Louis maintained some sort of supernatural hope, even then. And the quote from that Hillebrand, Laura Hillebrand wrote, about his his hope uh, that actually helped him survive. Louis and Phil's hope displaced their fear and inspired them to work together through survival. And each success renewed their physical and emotional vigor. She, she goes on to say, Louis and Phil's optimism and Max's hopelessness were becoming self-fulfilling according to psychology today. Hope can always affect aspects of life, even academic achievement. You know, we, we find that Louis was able to carry this this hope, and I believe it carried him to that Billy Graham crusade. So deep down inside, even though he's self medicated with alcohol and all that, there was still something there, and some and he cut a deal with God, and and the deal was still there. God doesn't forget you. God wants to talk to you no matter where you are, where you what you've been doing, who you slept with last night, where you slept last night, whatever. He's still waiting. He'll stand there and wait at the door until you open it. And he did that with Louis. Louis invited him in in that raft, and he stayed with Louis all the way through. And you need to know that you have hope, no matter what your situation is. In spite of the fact that, you know, Louis Zamperini was in probably one of the most, you know, ill-conceived possible, you know, I'm never going to get out of this situation. I'm never going to get out. He still somehow maintained this remarkable hope through everything, you know. Um, Barry Hoffman um, wrote this, cutting edge science shows that hope, at least as defined by psychologists, matters a lot. Cutting edge science shows that hope, at least as defined by psychologists, matters a lot. I'm talking about a different hope a lot to, uh, most of, for the most part today, but to be honest with you, hope springs eternal, you know. Eventually, you're going to you're going to come out of that situation. You're going to be delivered from the situation. You're going to recover from the situation, um, to be removed from the situation. But Louis' resilient hope remained with him after the war as he battled emotional and mental obstacles rather than less physical ones. 
to the point, like I said, where he walked into a Billy Graham kind uh, thing and, and hears the words of life. He had a hope of a future freed from the torments of the past, and he did not give in to despair. Where there's still life, there's still hope, Louis wrote. And I think if there's anything you hear tonight, Louis wrote that himself in his own autobiography. Where there's still life, there's still hope. So maybe the last thing is let it go. Maybe the reason that Disney's Frozen Anthem was so overwhelmingly popular is people resonated with them. I, I, I love the song. I have it on my Spotify. I'm not a big Frozen fan. It's an okay uh, uh, Disney film. It's not one of my favorites, but I love the song. But holding on to fears and pain only creates more pain. If you're holding on to the past like that and the pain, it's only going to create more pain. Um, you need, despite, despite, you know, what you think, it, you want to you want to not look over your shoulder too often. You want to look forward. I always say to people, look over your shoulder if you need insp inspiration how God deliver you from something. But don't always look over your shoulder to see where you where you were or where you failed or how hard life was. You know, look over your shoulder only to see that God's hand got you through something. Back to Louis, he he found a way to let go of the past, which seemed to help him live a more enjoyable and fulfilling life after war. I, like I said, 70 years of happiness. It's not always that way. Um, as Louis wrote to his letter to Wintabi, the bird, as a result of my prisoner of war experience under your unwarranted and unreasonable punishment, my post-war life became a nightmare. We need, it was, it's a nightmare. We need, we need to get help. We need to get out. We need a, a way to get healthy and, and we need a way to let go of past trauma. His mind was not free, even though his body was free, right? World of Psychology blog points out this, that holding on to pain, hurt, or anger from the, part, from the past is counterproductive. It's not healthy. It adds to our stress. It hurts our ability to focus, study, and work. And it impacts every other area of relationship we have, even the ones not directly affected by the hurt so we can't we can't even manage our relationships we can't work well we can't focus because we're holding on to something you know um i was uh, i went to a talk with a with a, a gentleman who was retiring and he was quoting his daughter who was dying of a catastrophic illness and she she was interviewed and i i've never been able to find an interview because the quote was so amazing and he and she said this to her father as she's she's slipping away you know when you hold on to something so tightly you can't grasp the thing that's next for you to grab onto sometimes we have to let go of something to grab something better so if you're holding on to something this is the best thing i've ever had and i and i'm coveting it and i'm obsessing over it like like Gollum with the ring and Lord of the Rings, you know, like that ring, you know what I mean? My precious, you got to let go of something to grab something else. And in, in a state of, of duress of, of PTSD, you have to get help to learn to let go of whatever it is. And Louis could not overcome the enormity of his suffering and challenges he experienced to her until he learned to overcome the challenge of post-traumatic stress after the war which he did with extraordinary speed and effectiveness, like his running. I mean, once he, once he turned the corner, he, he, he overcame that mental and emotional obstacle. He went on to become a great speaker. He started a camp for troubled youth and guess where he carried the Olympic torch in Nagano, Japan. And if that isn't hope, Spring eternal. I don't know what it is. A guy who said, I'm never going back to Japan. He carried the torch at Nagano. And I, I just love that. Awful memories haunt everybody with PTSD. Condemning words um, may invade your thoughts. But what happened was terrible. And, what, and the truth is there. Uh, that you're beautiful and you're amazing. And you have amazing purpose in this world. Uh, your family and, you know, and, and within your community to fulfill. And, and you, you still have that. 
and you can apply tr this truth to any situation. Um, if you have faith in Christ, we can apply the truth that you're clothed in righteousness and you are precious and loved. And you can apply that truth to who you are in Christ and to, to the to the truth of your past experiences. Don't don't let go. You you have a purpose and and you can apply the truth that you're loved to your past experiences. Each one needs to remember who we are and and remember that we're still in Christ and apply the truth to those those terrible traumas. And, it, and you might have to apply that truth over and over again, that you're loved and you're appreciated and you have purpose. And um, if you if you if it still hurts and the opportunity to build a deeper confidence in God's word isn't there, you, you need to you need to exercise some some steps to that. You know, you need to allow the, the truth to come to yourself, you know, and and kind of remember that that you know god really truly loves you as a scripture from john this was from that jesus was saying by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him for whenever our heart condemns us god is greater than our heart and he knows everything and this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son christ jesus and love one another just as he's commanded us and i i want to read that middle section again in case you missed it for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. If you're condemning yourself because you were in a trauma, God's healing is in, in is, is in the timing, and His timing is always right. And if you're listening, it's no accident. And if you need to talk confidentially about the pain, yeah, you need to get the right help. Um, you let me know, and I'll get your resources. One's emerge.org. Um, you know, they're an amazing group. I know the guy who runs it and I'll put that, I'll be posting that link um, underneath this talk and, and get some help. You know, you get healed up and people, people are there to help you. People are there to help you. They will not condemn you. They will help you work through. They have inpatient and outpatient counseling. And there's another one. I won't read that one here, but you know, just know that, that, there are people that talk to you confidentially about your pain. I will talk to you confidentially about your pain. Um, but let me know and, and we'll get you these resources out to you. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative that you, 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 you've been through, uh, through a lot and you sat here and listened to me talking about it. So the last week, uh, next week I'll be out of town. Um, so the following week we're going to talk about the last week we're going to talk about loving the obstacles of life. So <laughs> You'll probably never come back for that. So overcoming the obstacles of loving the obstacles of life. So um, it's kind of like a recap, and hopefully I will uh, I will see you see you soon. And blessings to you, and uh, and have a great week. And again, reach out to me if you need me. Okay, take care. Bye bye. Oh, my.